So in today's video, I'm going to show you how to make this 4x5 assembly table. So with my setup here in the shop, I knew that I was only going to have access to three sides of this table uh, because I'm going to be using this also as my outfeed table. And with that back side butted up against the table saw, I knew that I couldn't put any storage as far as drawers or doors on that side of the table. So the best way that I thought to rearrange this was to put rotate the drawers and put them on this side facing out that way. Uh, that way it gave me 15 inch deep, 14 inch wide drawers. Uh, for a total of eight drawers on this side and the storage that was left I have two doors over here on this side of the table that allows me to have 16 inch wide 37 inch deep uh, Sections that I could then put some adjustable shelves on to give me plenty of storage on the right side of this table Now if I were to put one door on the left and then a bank of drawers and then another door I would have a lot of wasted space behind these drawers in the center because you obviously don't want to make drawers that are 37 and a quarter inches deep uh, you would have a lot of wasted space or you would have the world's deepest drawers. So what I ended up doing was just rotating them and then putting them on the left side of the assembly table in a completely separate section from these two sections here on the right. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into the build video. I built this whole assembly table using four sheets of three quarter inch plywood and three sheets of MDF. I opted to use pre-finished plywood because I actually got it cheaper than shop grade birch at my local hardwood dealer. Since I had all this plywood laying around in my shop, the first thing I did was to break it down into smaller pieces with my track saw. I laid everything out to maximize the cross cuts. When breaking down the sheet goods, I made sure to put a piece of tape and write down which sheet of ply it came from so I know which parts are where after I'm done. This part of the project probably took me a couple of hours, but in the end it was worth it because I really don't have the room for full length sheets of plywood. And as you can see, this is what four sheets of plywood looks like once it's cut down. Alright, so with the parts in a more manageable size, I begin cutting the side panels to width at 29 inches. Earlier, I used the track saw when breaking the sheet goods down to cut this panel to length of 37 and a quarter inches. I cut both of the side panels to this width. Next, I reset the fence to 28 and a quarter and cut the center divider. It's important to note that the center divider is three quarters of an inch shorter than the side panels. With the side panels and the center divider cut to size, I change gears and route the grooves for the bottom shelves. To make the grooves, I'm using my plunge router with a 23-30 seconds router bit specifically made for plywood. I clamp the edge guide in place and set my combination square to the distance from the edge so that I can quickly set the edge guide on the other panels and make sure that it's going to be in the same exact location. This is especially important for the center divider because it will be getting a groove on both faces. With the grooves cut, I begin cutting the 3x3 toe kicks in the center divider and in one of the side panels. The side panel that meets the drawer compartment doesn't get the toe kicked removed as you can see in this picture. So to begin, I put a piece of masking tape on both sides of the panel to prevent any tear out. I then make a mark 3 inches from the edge and the bottom of the panel. I then use my jigsaw to remove the waste. And as you can see, the tape really helped to prevent any of the tear out on both sides of the panel. And so next, I repeat these same steps for the center divider to remove the toe kick. So before I assembled the cabinet, I needed to drill for the shelf pin since I wanted an adjustable shelf. I made a center mark between the top of the panel and the top of the groove to align the shelf pin jig width. For this operation, I'm using the Craig shelf pin jig and a quarter inch brad point bit since I'm using quarter inch shelf pins. It's really important to note that since the center divider is three quarters of an inch shorter than the side panels, you will need to move the shelf pin holes three quarters of an inch closer to the top edge of the panel. If you don't move the jig closer to the top edge, the holes will be lower on the center divider than the side panels. So the last pieces I needed to cut before assembly were the bottom shelves. So I took the panels over to the table saw and cut them to width and to the length. To begin the glue up, I first put glue in the dados. Next, I placed the bottom shelf in the dado and made sure that it was flush with the front of the side panel. I placed a piece of scrap wood under the bottom shelf and began putting glue in the dado on the center divider. To hold everything into place, I'm using 2 inch long 18 gauge brad nails. So with the assistance of a shop helper, or in this case my dad, I put the bottom shelf in the center divider's dado and added a couple of clamps to help hold everything together before adding the brad nails.
With the left side of the cabinet all glued and nailed, I went ahead and put the glue in the bottom divider, attached the bottom shelf, and then attached the right side panel, again using brad nails and glue. So with the cabinet assembled, I cut three structural support pieces to nail across the top to add stability to the cabinet. They're three inches wide and 32 and three quarters of an inch long. To attach the support pieces, I place them down on the center divider and make sure they are flush with the top of the side panels and nail them in. The front support should also be flush with the front edge of the cabinet. Next I drilled a few pilot holes to attach the base to the top. I started by drilling from the top so that when I made the countersink holes on the bottom, it would be easier. Now the best thing to do would have been to drill these holes before attaching the structural supports, but I tend to do things the hard way the first time. Next I switch gears and cut the back panel of the cabinet. This is the panel that spans the full length of the cabinet and is also used as the drawer compartment panel. I use the table saw to cut it to the width of 29 inches and then the track saw to cut it to length of 50 inches. And as you can see, this is exactly why I needed an assembly table. The fold out table that I was using was way too flimsy for tasks like this. So next I clamp the back panel on the cabinet while I cut away the toe kick. Before attaching the back panel, you need to think about which side you want the drawers on. The way that I placed the toe kick, I had my drawers on the left side of the cabinet. After drawing some reference lines, I then used my brad nailer to attach the back panel. Moving on to the drawer compartment, I cut the panels to length. The center divider again is 3 quarters of an inch shorter than the other two panels for structural supports, so I adjust the fence to 28 and a quarter inches before making the cut. And like the other panels, I cut the 3x3 toe kick. I clamped the two panels together and cut them both at the same time. To attach the drawer compartment panels, I used pocket holes. It's a fast and secure way to attach them. I drilled four pocket holes on the side panel as well as the center divider. It's important to drill the pocket holes on the correct face on the side panel, but on the center divider you can drill on either side of the board. To assist in spacing the two panels, I cut a couple of spacers to 17 and 7 eighths of an inch long. I added some green tape to the end of the panels because I removed a little too much off of the length. With the panel placed up against the spacers, I hold it in place with a clamp to prevent it from moving when adding the screws. With the cabinet on its back, I went ahead and cut the toe kick panel to size and attached it with brad nails. Next, I flipped the cabinet back over and installed the structural supports in the drawer compartment, again making sure they were flush with the top of the panels and the front of the cabinet. And finally, I put the cabinet on its back and installed the final toe kick panel. So moving on, I started breaking down the parts for the drawers. All of the box parts are made from the same 3 quarter plywood, and for the bottom panel, I used quarter inch plywood. For the joinery, I wanted something quick and easy, so I went with half laps on the front and back drawer box panels. I inserted my dado stack and dialed in the perfect fence setting as you can see here. To cut the half lap, I used my miter gauge and removed the waste using the dado stack. I rotate the board and remove the waste from the opposite side. I did this operation on 16 of the 32 drawer box parts. Next, I switched the dado blade to a quarter inch and set the fence back a quarter of an inch from the blade and cut a groove for the bottom panel. I made this cut on all inside faces of the 32 panels. To assemble the drawer boxes, I like to use these right angle corner clamps. They help hold everything in place while nailing the corners. I opted to not put any glue in the corners but instead just use nails. I put three nails in each corner and then removed the clamps. Next, I slid the bottom panel in and clamped the back panel in place to hold it while I shot the nails. After shooting three nails in the four corners, I rotate the box and shoot three more nails on the opposite corners to give me a total of six nails in each corner, more than strong enough for shop drawers. To install the drawer slides, I cut a spacer to a three and an eighth inch wide to fit inside of the cabinet. This spacer is only used for the bottom drawer. Next, I set my combination square to a sixteenth and push the drawer slides back from the face of the cabinet and then install the three screws provided with the drawer slides. After the drawer slide was installed, I placed a spacer on the opposite side of the cabinet and installed the second drawer slide. For the remaining drawers, I switched using a four and three quarter inch wide spacer. Just like before, I placed the drawer slide on the spacer, set it back a sixteenth from the edge and installed the screws. I keep doing this until all eight drawers are installed. To install the drawer fronts, I again use a spacer to make this job not only faster, but more accurate. This spacer is four and an eighth inches wide. I clamped it in place and pushed the slide up against the spacer and make the end of the slide flush with the edge of the drawer. And just like before, I installed the three screws. I then removed the clamps, flip the box drawer over, and repeat the same steps for the other side. Using spacers were a real time saver in this project. 
Before cutting the drawer fronts, I measure the opening of the cabinet to get my dimensions. It's always best to measure the actual project pieces instead of going off of the plans. With that measurement in hand, I cut the false drawer fronts to width and length at the table saw. For grain continuity, I cut four drawer panels out of one big piece of plywood. This adds a little to the appearance of the drawers. Had I done a better job of breaking down the plywood, I could have gotten all eight drawer fronts out of one piece, but it's not too bad. Before attaching the drawer fronts, I countersink two holes on the inside face of the drawer box for using to attach the false fronts. Then I clamp a scrap piece to the bottom of the cabinet to set the drawer front on. This ensures that the drawer front won't drop below the toe kick and helps keep things consistent. Next, I place a drawer front on the scrap board and make sure that it is flush with the left side of the cabinet. With everything flush, I add two clamps to hold the drawer front in the exact location and install the two screws. Moving forward, I place an eighth inch shim on the drawer below the one I'm working on to give each drawer front a consistent gap between the drawers. With the drawer front flush with the side of the cabinet, I clamp it in place and again screw in the two screws. Next up, I tackle the cabinet doors. I cut them to width and then length at the table saw. There are several different ways to install the hinges, and this is just a method that I used. To begin, I made a mark on the cabinet 3.5 inches from the top and the bottom. Next, I line up the hinges on the center line and install the screws. This step is optional, but I find it easier to do it now instead of trying to install the screws with the hinges on the door. To make reference marks on the door, I place the door on a spacer that raises the door to make it flush with the top of the cabinet and transfer the marks to the door from the cabinet. Next, I line up the center lines with the template that came with the hinges and using my scratch awl, I make a mark on the door. The hinges require a 35 millimeter bit, but I didn't have one so I used an inch and 3 8 Forstner bit to drill the holes. Next, I place the hinges in the hole and using a combination square, made sure they were square to the edge of the door. Next, I place a clamp on the hinge to hold it in place and install the screws. Finally, I place the door back on the spacer and reinstall the hinges. Since my garage floor isn't level and because the assembly table is lower than my table saw, I installed four leg levelers on the assembly table so that I can raise the height and level out the table. With the base done, I move on to building the torsion box top. I cut all of the grid parts to width of 2.5 inches and now I need to come to the length. I begin by cutting the divider pieces to 46.5 inches long using a stop block on my miter gauge. Next, I cut the two longer strips to 60 inches and since there were only two of them, I didn't use my stop block. And finally, I batched out the 46 grid pieces to 7 and 23 30 seconds long. Before I started working on the top, I jointed two edges of 6 2x4s to give me a dead flat surface on my table. I used my longest straight edge to confirm that everything was dead flat. If I had any gaps, I placed a shim under that 2x4. Next, I placed one of the oversized panels on the 2x4s and began building the grid. I began building the grid by nailing one divider to the long rails with 2 inch brad nails. To keep everything equally spaced, I cut a spacer to 5 and 5 30 seconds to place between each grid piece. With the grid piece in place, I attached it with a few brad nails. I continued this process for the first row of the grid. Next, I slide in another divider piece and attach it to the grid. Every other row, I would start off with the larger spacer to offset the grid. So the second row, I placed an 8 and 7 64 long spacer in first and then put the grid piece in place. After the first grid piece is nailed in place, I can then go back to the original spacer to set the distance between the grid pieces. I keep alternating spacers until the entire grid is complete. Before attaching the top, I put glue on the top edges of the entire grid. With the help of a friend, or in my case, my dad, I placed the top sheet on the grid and attached it with brad nails. After the glue setup, I flipped the top over, spread more glue on the grid, and installed the bottom panel again with brad nails. Since I cut the top and the bottom panels oversized, I needed to remove the excess, so I installed a flush trim bit on my router and flushed up both sides of the top. I wanted to attach hardwood around the edge of the table to help protect it from abuse, so I went with cherry since I had some in the lumber rack already milled to the correct thickness. I cut it to 4 inches wide at the table saw and then the length at the miter saw. I clamped a scrap board to the edge of the table to aid in installing the hardwood trim. 
Again, I just use brad nails to attach the hardwood trim. After installing the hardwood edging, I use my block plan to flush everything up. To ease the edge of the hardwood, I routed a chamfer just using my plunge router and a 45 degree chamfering bit. To protect the top from things like glue and finish, I applied two coats of a wipe-on polyurethane. This just happened to be what I had on hand from a previous project. You could also apply just a water-based polyurethane as well. I applied a total of two coats. To apply the polyurethane, I just used a couple of scrap pieces from a cut-up t-shirt. Since completing the assembly table, it didn't take me long to realize that I should have built this thing a long time ago. In my opinion, right after the workbench, the assembly table is one of the most important parts of my workshop. It's a big, dead flat surface that you can use for assembling your projects, and I couldn't be happier to have mine. If you enjoyed this project, smash that like button below and share this with a friend. If you're not subscribed to my channel, hit that subscribe button as well. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next build video.